Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report presented by Great Days Outdoors Magazine. The first podcast to bring you the local inshore, offshore, and onshore fishing report, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. We have a great show lined up, but first, let's hear who is making the show possible this week. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report is brought to you by Great Days Outdoors Magazine. Are you looking for that one-of-a-kind gift for Father's or Mother's Day? If so, head on over to greatdaysoutdoors.com and check out the best gifts for outdoorsmen 2021. We've curated a bunch of unique gift ideas to help you find an awesome gift for the outdoorsman on your list. Just head over to greatdaysoutdoors.com slash best gifts for outdoorsmen to check it out. And also brought to you by Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks. Save time and money by buying from the most reliable manufacturer on the Gulf Coast. Buy it today, pick it up today. They offer 20 Sherwin-Williams colors to choose from and have a 40-year warranty. Baker Metal and Dixie Supply, two names, same great service. With the addition of their new store in Cantonment, Florida, they now have eight locations to serve you. Dixie Supply and Baker Metal Works, your metal roofing headquarters. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am your host, Butch Theory, and I am joined today in the studio with Captain Bobby Abrascato as my co-host. How are we doing today, Cap? Man, you got my hands tied behind my back. Keep me away from the knobs and the dials and stuff like that. The (laughs) knobs and the dials have gone way down since we first started this thing, though. (laughs) Yeah. We've got it uh, pretty streamlined now. Gosh, I I still have some stuff in my office that I was looking at the other day. I mean, we used to have big, giant motherboards and... (laughs) switches and multiple monitors but now i can pretty much do this anywhere you got it down you yeah. look like you you know kind of like me typing now i still have to look at the keyboard but you're all doing <laughs> it without right. even looking at it typing and all, doing yeah. it all at once yeah i wish not but yeah we got you're we amphibious man you can do it with both hands i don't think that's the word you're <laughs> yeah. looking for but i like it <laughs> we're gonna have captain patrick garmerson on here in a minute it's not a whole lot going on in the offshore world when you can get out there it's good but man look look today you know mm-hmm. look what we got it didn't there hadn't been a whole lot of days in between where it was much better than this. That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, fortunately, from the inshore standpoint, as long as it's not lightning is about the only thing that keeps us at the dock. Right. You know, and um, so fortunately, we can fish in it, and you kind of expect it this time of year as far as the wind goes. You know, and within reason, the weather, the rain, you know, you can fish in a certain level of rain and be comfortable. We tournament fish in anything except lightning. But, you know, as long as we don't have that, we can get it out. So that's where I don't envy having to be an offshore guy as much as I, I love trying to learn how to offshore fish a little bit. Yeah. You know, the fact that we can go a lot of times, maybe sometimes when you might not be able to go offshore, especially mm-hmm. in the spring, it's going to blow in the spring. Oh, you know yeah. it's going to. Yep. And I, I said for a long time, you know, if you're waiting for the wind to quit blowing in the spring, you might as well take up bowling because right. you ain't going fishing. I can tell you, you know, but no if you doubt. learn how to use it, and I, you know, like we were talking about before we went on the air, you know, I look forward to some wind within, the, you know, mm-hmm. you know, 10 to 20 knots is great with me. I, you know, you got to have it this time of year if you're fishing shallow stuff, because if it gets slick, I mean, they just, it's hard to catch them when it gets slick. And the gnats too. Oh my gosh. Depending not on to even mention fishing. the bugs, Woo. man. Woo. I'll tell you, it's, uh, I have tried everything. I don't, my, something re- i react poorly with deet anything with deet in it uh, mm. affects me so i have tried all sorts of stuff and to keep them off and um but i carry gallons of it on the boat and um and it it, it nothing really gets rid of those things no. i'm telling you they're going to be around it may keep them maybe for biting you a little bit but they're going to be in your hair and your your I, I beard don't, yeah you know, i don't know i don't know that i've ever my mom still swears on skin so soft well and it it's as good as anything but nothing i think works it right. just yeah. it just makes them stick to yeah. you know, where they can't bite you but yeah. i guess that's a win too you yeah, know I that's mean. it and you know and, and and all it takes it doesn't take a gale force wind no. a five knot wind just will take a little just a little breath of wind is all it takes yep. but the spring is when they're the worst you know and then we've had the rain that we've had in the last few weeks or month i think that compounds it too but it's always during the spring is when they're so bad yep. you know and so yeah a lot of sitting water for sure yeah and uh even when we get to the docks in the morning um and you're just praying that those people be on time so you know i'll go sit out in the river I, i'm not going to sit at that dock no, if there's no wind up. oh you get torn up mm. man so the only other thing that works 100 percent against them is clothes so you're wearing That's long true. pants which you don't want to this time no. of year and socks and gloves and everything else no doubt uh, a little but, warm the, but you know the, the the other thing the fish been biting as good as the gnats so that's that's, that's the positive you <laughs> know so we thing. we've had some really good trips numbers are no problem we're catching tons of fish tons of fish you know just lots good. of fish lots of action i love the spring I, I love well i love it all but i love the springtime fishing where we're you know there's always some action going on you're rarely mm-hmm. having a little slow periods now you know, again, you, I haven't been breaking any state record size wise, except for like big bull reds, these big bull reds, I don't even know where these I've seen them good, but they're all over the place as you experienced. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even on the inshore side, I've never caught as many, you know, just trout fishing 
all of a sudden get, and I'm not talking about a 22 or 24 inch slot. I'm talking about these big Hammers. 30. Oh man. Yeah. I, and then we're catching all little popping cork rigs, you know? So yeah. you talk about world war three, but as long as I've been doing this, I don't remember catching as every trip we've caught at least two and sometimes six, you know, that's and, awesome. You know, and just out of the middle of nowhere. Right. You know? So, uh, it's, uh, it's been good. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the numbers of fish that are around. There's a lot of fresh water that has come down the bay, which has forced us, you know, west of down into the sound, which stays really clear. Mm -hmm. Even when we get a lot of local rain, you still get good, clear, salty water and the fish they put, you know, so that's where I've been spending most of my time. And, and we've had a, we had a really good top water trip one day last week. It was my first really effort on top water. We've always thrown mm -hmm. a little bit, but we had a, I had a group that said, Man, we ain't fish with corks since we were 12 years old. Take them off or put them pop. <laughs> I said, all right. I said, I'm going to keep one tied on for me because that's how we're going to put the fish in the boat. Yeah. And um, we ended up having a really good, exceptionally good top water morning. As a matter of fact, it was so good to where the guy, uh, we caught our, it was three of us and we had our 18 before the sun cleared the trees. That's and, awesome. Yeah. And one of the guys was flying out later that day and he went ahead and switched his flight and I dropped him off at 745 in the morning <laughs> and we caught every one of our fish on top water. Hey, so you can't argue yeah, with that. Yeah. Uh, you know, and again, they weren't wall hangers, but they were, you know, 18 to 21 or 22 inch fish and, um, good grade of fish. Oh yeah. It was good quality fish. And, um, you know, again, being all on top water was, was a blast. So, <clears throat> so what made you go to top water? You think the water temperatures are, it is, this there? is a top water time of the year. You know, it's just, when you get in this water temperature range, which it was 68, it was uh, last day I fished was yesterday and it was 68 to 70 you know, when I finished up and that's just kind of that, maybe that 68, 72, I fish it year round, right. you know, except maybe during the dead of winter, you know, I'll always have try and find some opportunity to throw a top water, but this in the fall, this in the fall to me is prime top water time right now. The fish that I'm around are really on small, there's no shrimp, but they're on small glass minnows. So it's still kind of hard to get them to hit a top water, but sure. again, you get around the right group of fish and the fish we caught on the trip yesterday, we caught all on corks, but on voodoo's, I was wishing we were throwing top water because these were some really qual best quality mm -hmm. trout. I've, you know, uh, even though we caught a hundred and plus trout, you know, we had some really quality fish mixed in with them. Uh, I should have tried some top water yesterday. Dad and I went exploring before we went out and did the Dixie bar shuffle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we went over, which I never, ever do. Uh, and he doesn't either. We just kind of were exploring. He got a new 24 blazer bay and we went over to the east side of uh, the bay kind of over the san st andrews area mm -hmm. they call it san andrews little bay point clear yeah yeah little little point clear and it was it was mullet i mean everywhere uh -huh. <laughs> is it i mean that's a good that's usually something i like to look for you know i was throwing a slick lure a little yeah. bit early we had some live shrimp and we tried and, and had a little bit of success so i just started started throwing a slick I was like, man there's too many mullet here why would they eat this slick lure <laughs> yeah yeah, I sometimes, mean, it was insane, the yeah, mullet. The worst recipe you can get as a fisherman is to be around a few fish and a lot of bait. You right. want to be around a lot of fish and a little bit of bait. That's why they're, right. that's when they're more willing to eat your, your bait. I don't know. I know? just wasn't expecting to see all those mullet there. And, of course, the porpoises showed up. Oh, well, that'll take care of and it. I don't were, care how good it is. I mean, they were yeah. doing, like, the creating a tidal wave thing. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? You're, you, yep. And you I pack was like, it we're up hosed. And go. Exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. Let's you go. pack it up and go. Those fish they never going to bite, especially in the shallow stuff. Yeah, They're not going to, we and they even the deep stuff, they don't either, but that shallow stuff, you get them porpoises around. They man. were fired I up. I tell everybody is like three things that'll ruin a, a trout bite are people, porpoises, and sharks. That'll, that'll ruin it every time, you know? Yep. No doubt. All right, man. Well, I say we uh, get Captain Patrick Garmison in here. Let's see what he's been up to. And uh, we'll just kind of compare you guys notes. I know y'all have been doing different things in different areas and we'll just uh, get the inshore report from both of you guys and go from there. All right, welcome back to the show, Captain Patrick. How are we doing today, buddy? Man, I'm doing well. We uh, I had had some customers today that were a little concerned about the weather, and I I assured them I said, well, we we got enough time to get something done, and they caught a bunch of redfish, had quote unquote the best fishing trip of their life. All right, so, um, Ooh, we love hearing that. That's was, right. That's a good, think, <laughs> a good thing to hear. Love hearing. I think that. it was a I think it was a huge success. So anyway, that. Once I got done cleaning the boat and dancing around in the rain a little bit, I had to get home and get a get a nice warm shower. I bet. So, uh, well, you made a you made a better call. You made a better call on the weather than I did. I uh, I wish I'd I get when I was looked at this morning. I'm like, man, I should have gone today. Golly, you know. And I guess it started pouring here about probably about eleven. Yeah, you could have gotten in like well, Patrick did. You could have gotten in this morning. That's for sure. 
Yeah, we shut it down. I, I took a look at the weather. I was on the east side of the bay, and I took a look at the weather. We started hearing a little more thunder rumbles. It wasn't like claps of thunder. We just started hearing the rumbles, and I looked at the radar, and it was like perfectly on the western edge of the bay. And I said, all right. <laughs> That's think, close uh, enough. We got a, I think we got a good dose of it. Let's take it to the house. So we, we wrapped it on up. Nice. Dang, that's great, man. Yeah. New boats looking good, man. I saw you out on the Dixie bar yesterday. That was fun. Dude, that was, uh, I hadn't done that in a long time. And to top it off, I was even with my dad. So that was, that was, that, that was fun. That was, that was good to see y'all. So man, I was a, that I'd get the rare, I get the rare occurrence to be able to go out and go fishing on my own. Like, and typically when even when i'm on my own and if i find some bull reds or something i'm usually like you know catch two or three <laughs> like take some pictures all right now let's take it to the house or go do something else or whatever but i had the uh i had the mission this that morning where the mississippi hatchery has hired me to go and we're doing this bull red collection for those guys and we we ran out Found the found a school of fish within about 20 minutes. We boated four of them really quick. Put them in the boat. Put them in the live wells, and hauled butt back to Billy Goat Hole. Dropped them off, and the guy was like, "Man, that was great, thanks." And he was headed back to Mississippi. And I had uh, I had Je uh, Zach Jessup from L and M Marine on the boat with me, and I, I looked at him. I was like. Well, I'd planned on fishing until about 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock today. Uh, what you got? And he's like, nothing. I said, well, <laughs> you want to go stick a few more fish? He's like, yeah, well, let's do it. And so we, we rode back across and caught two, did some FaceTime or some uh, uh, Facebook live video just to do some social media stuff. And then um, and, and when we caught them, I was like, man, we need to tag these. Because I remember uh, Crystal in a couple episodes yeah, ago was right. talking about wanting more bull red tags out there. So Merritt gave us 25 uh, last week, 25 bull red tags. And we tagged a couple already this week. And so I had 23 tags. And I was like, man, I think we can do this. Let's <laughs> knock out this whole bundle of tags today. Y'all crazy. <laughs> hey, hey, dude, I'm here to tell you my, my shoulder, <laughs> my pecs, my, like almost my entire body is sore from, uh, from dragging those bruisers in. And I, I was it. regretting my decision, but at, at the point of when we got down to like having about five or six, seven tags left over, I was like, let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. Can't and, stop at that point. Yeah. yeah, yeah you're yeah, committed. We committed to it. We committed to it. Went ahead and knocked out the whole bundle of tags Merritt gave me. And I, and I texted her before I got back, I said, I need some more bull red tags. <laughs> and, uh, she met me at the dock with 50 more. So, um, that's awesome, man. Yeah. yeah that was so now we got, now we got our next mission ahead of us, but man, it was great to see you and your dad out there bowed up on a few. It was fun. Yeah. He had a good time. I bet he sore today too. We caught probably four or five a piece and, it started blowing pretty good, man. And uh, he's like, we had some live shrimp from messing around with trout early that morning. He's like, you want to go try for some sheep head? And I was like, I don't, I don't think so, man. I think I'm good. <laughs> it was. It was getting really bumpy out there when I left. Yeah, and we made the right choice. It started gassing right after that. So I'm glad, glad we called it whenever we did for sure. That was a crazy brown chocolate milk mississippi sound mobile bay to i mean crystal emerald colored water yesterday i don't know if i've ever seen one that good that far in shore man so in the last few years i've noticed that when you get that perfectly nice incoming tide with a little bit of east wind that water will tend to push all the way over to the edge of the bar and just be gin clear emerald green water and then have that poo poo brown mm -hmm. muddy fresh water coming out of the bay and they will not mix like it is a hard to find line and i'm sure you saw that i mean it's Crazy. like it's it's black and white difference between yep. the two and it's you know what i find a little interesting is I, I rarely find fish like right on that rip like i always think about you listening to the offshore guys that you know, they live for those kind of color changes yep. and those rips and stuff. And I, 
I've personally never caught many bull reds on those rips. What about you, Bobby? Uh, you've been doing this a lot longer than I have. Yeah, and I think what happens is what we were talking about. And I, can't, I can't remember if we were recording this, but we talked about recording it. Is I think what happens is you get, even on the surface, it looks to us like there's this real defined line that more, functions more like a wedge. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? To where you're, you know, even though we're seeing that line on the surface, that green water line is uh coming through is like a wedge so those fish could be and i've been out there catching them where i've drifted into seen exactly what you're Mm -hmm. talking about and drifted into the muddy water and really even start or continue to catch them or start to catch them and and that and i think that's what it is is i think you've got still pretty clear it's not a vertical line you know what i'm saying i think it's more of a diagonal line or maybe even less than a diagonal line almost like a just a layer of brown because we were talking about and again i don't know if we recorded this so i apologize if i repeat myself but you know, I've been, and we've all done it where we've been idling through that stuff when the green real pretty water's nearby idling through it. And you look mm-hmm. back in your, in your wash and it's, it's this beautiful water boiling up behind, you know, and we so, were not recording and Richard was doing the Dixie bar stuff last week. And he said the same exact thing. Yeah. About, you'll see that, that yeah. water come up. So I think that's the case and is what's going on there. And, uh, and then, you know, this too, you guys know this too is even though that that water discourages us for as mm-hmm. fishermen that off colored water those bull reds you know they'll even if there is a column of some off colored water if there's something to eat yeah, in there they they're care. gonna get in that stuff and, oh yeah you know they what i'm saying care. they don't care man i mean you know we've all caught them and just you know and 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 like you have too i'm sure you know save trips where we're getting muddy water situations and those redfish continue to eat you know so yeah i I, uh i know exactly what you're talking about but as far as like the rip line goes it's it's uh you know to your question is is i've caught them through you know dragging through the green water or vice versa the brown water and continue to catch them all the way through and i think it's just because that there is that Mm -hmm. whatever layer it is that they're they're relating to is 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 there you know that makes sense yeah that makes sense yeah there was no doubt yesterday i mean as soon as i think high tide was like 11 20 or 11 30 yesterday and as soon as that uh that doo-doo water started moving you could tell it was kind of coming you know out of the bay and going down towards the east the birds disappeared and the fish were gone they'd had enough but you know i wonder i wonder if once that tide really starts humping it coming back out because we were catching them all on that incoming tide Mm -hmm. i've seen it where those fish are kind of really like almost sunning like we were seeing them yeah um, they were up and, and they were not the, going down at all yesterday uh-uh. and then as soon as that mud starts pouring out and coming across the bar what i've found is i've had to just switch tactics and just put those baits on the bottom mm-hmm. and then just start doing the dixie bar drift yep. and just run up to the point drop those baits and just let that current just pull the boat you can turn the motor off and just drift <laughs> That's what I've seen once that tide switches and starts dumping back out. Yep, mm-hmm. yep, that's exactly right. That's just what happens is I think you get that energy coming out of the bay, getting pulled out, even with, you know, what salinity is in that water, pull it out. Still, there's such a volume of water that's got to get out of that pass that it's going to spread back to the east, even though eventually it's going to all turn and go back to the west. You know, but there's all that, when that's coming out, you know, that all that, that water's not coming from the, the incoming water's not coming from the east anymore. So you got the energy is actually coming out, you know, south and, and even east because of the volume of water that's got to come. And it's doubled up because you got all the river water that's coming down with it, you know. So you're really getting a lot of a lot of volume of water coming out of there. Yep. That was going to be my next topic. River levels are high. They're still yep. high. And I think they're going to be high for a little while after this after these next three days. I looked at it this morning and it looks like it shows on the Alabama and on the Tom. You get this, it's it, it dropped down to where it wasn't out of flood, but it was at it's just about to come out of flood. And it looks like we're going to get a little bubble and then it's going to drop on out. And I think Barry this morning, I looked at it this morning. Barry was at 10, which has been up around 12, and it's at 10 and it's kind of leveled off at 10. So it's, I just don't know how much we're going to get out of the local the stuff along the coast, which is where a lot of these systems that are coming through right now are staying. Mm-hmm. doesn't affect that. This is stuff that's upstate uh, is what affects that. And, you know, as long as we just depends on how much rain we get out of these next couple of systems north of us here is what's going to affect that. Right. You know? But we're heading the right way. You know, I haven't been out there at the mouth of the bay in the last week, but, you know, hearing what you guys are saying, we're not far away from the lower end of the bay starting to clear up. If you got that green of water oh, right man. there at Fort Morgan. It was gorgeous. You know, there's a le- there's a layer of salinity that's surprised. coming up in the bay right now, and we're not far away. And that's that's kind of the number. When you start getting around seven 
at, at the reading at Barry, when you start getting around seven or eight, you've gotten fishable water up into the lower part of the bay. Mm -hmm. You can even fish the shoals and the bridge sometimes when you get Barry, reading at Barry at seven. So that's kind of where we're at right now yeah. um, as far as the river level goes. What you've been seeing, where you've been fishing, Captain Patrick? Yeah, I've been kind of punting on trying to be a trout fisherman. I've been been really just keying in on structure around the edges of the bay, on the on the west side of the bay, on the east side of the bay, just popping cork and live shrimp and getting some pretty doggone nice numbers of redfish. And we're catching redfish from little rat size all the way up to 25, 26 inch upper slots and then throwing in the occasional 29 to 31 inch redfish in the mix and been making some really good charters out of just red fishing here lately and so we fished the east side of the bay today and it was nothing but redfish we didn't see a puppy drum a sheephead a speckled trout or nothing uh, whereas on the west side of the bay the last couple of days we we were catching some trout not many but we were we were catching a few trout and we were catching some sheephead and the redfish, so I mean, it's a decent, like a pretty nice mixed bag of fish, and and some and some pretty steady action. But the the common theme on both sides of the bay is there's there's a lot of area that you're gonna fish. Best thing I can say is that is that I've been just putting myself in a position where we can just effectively fish an area and just keep moving, keep covering water, and then as soon as you get that bite, especially if you're in shallow water and you got the power poles or talons or some way to stop the boat, stop there. We're catching, I mean, upwards of 15 or 20 fish in one stop. So, uh, but you may have, you may have an hour and a half without a single bite, but then when you find that one group of fish, for instance, uh, I don't know, two or three days ago, we, we made a stop. We, we caught a fish, a sheephead right just in front of us is a daggone big ugly black drum with his tail sticking out of the water <laughs> so i'm like all right so a sheep head's here right. a black drum's here he's all, he's just waving at us so we posted up and we caught sheep head redfish and actually ended up hooking one of those big uglies and somehow popped the hook or something uh but anyway all of this life was in one probably <laughs> 20 foot 25 foot zone hmm. and once that bite died off we continued drifting a little bit further and not another bite so hmm. there's like i told my customers this morning i said look we're gonna do a good bit of fishing hopefully we get a decent amount of catching in there and luckily we did about an hour of fishing early and then nothing but catching the rest of the morning so yeah, you know, it's a good thing. Some days, some days you're more blessed than others <laughs> to be able to have a lot more catching than fishing. But uh, that's definitely the thing to do right now. As far as with this water being real muddy like this, I really haven't ventured into into the sound much uh, in the last couple of weeks. So Bobby may be able to speak on some of that. Maybe there's some cleaner water over there. But I mean, most of what I've been fishing has been visibility of about four to maybe 10 inches of, you know, maybe 10 inches of visibility. So it's not, it's not pretty to look at, but redfish or uh, redfish are notorious for not giving two, two craps about what color the water is. They're, they're, when they're ready to eat, they're going to eat. Uh, that's what we were just, yeah, yeah. Like, like we said, what we just talked about, you know, especially when you put that, you put that real stuff on them like that too, you know, and, uh, and that's class, you know, what you were just talking about, I'm sitting there nodding my head. I said, man, that's classic springtime fishing. It's a feast or famine deal, man. You know, it's when they're, when you're on them, I do the same thing. I'll grab, you know, if they get on the cell phone or start making a sandwich when the bites on them going, uh, -uh guys, uh, -uh. No, we not now. You're going to have plenty of time that's for right. that. I can promise <laughs> yes. you. You go catch, you better catch them now. I can tell you, That's right. you know, and That's then right. and sure in 20 don't. minutes, 20 minutes, you're going to get the old every time where'd they go cap. Okay. Well, I was, <laughs> I was trying to explain to you a minute ago, man, right. you got to catch them when they're biting because it ain't like, with you know, and I tell them it ain't going to be like this all day, guys. I'm telling you, you're going to have some downtime. So yep. you got to catch them when they're biting and you move along and boom, just like you described classic springtime fishing, man. Do you think those fish, whenever you found them, Patrick, do you, do you attribute it to anything, um, shell bottom, or you just think that was some bait in the area or something like that? In the areas I'm catching these redfish, I'm not seeing much of anything. I might see a mullet jump. I'm not seeing really any kind of like bait fish. So I think these guys are really kind of foraging for whatever's available. 
Yep, I agree with you. I think that's exactly what goes on too. Another thing during the spring is they're they're chewing what's ever in their way, especially those like he's talking about those reds, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, when you're talking about a, a school that that may be 20 or 30 redfish together and they're all in that say 15 to 22 inch range, I mean those those dudes are they're dang near jumping in the boat to get the shrimp out of the live well <laughs> when you get near them, yep. you yep. know. So that, and, and Bobby is dead on when you're committed to fishing and finding your fish and you get, you get hooked up, you need to get another line right there where that same one just came out of and just keep firing away into that spot until they quit biting, because you may not get another opportunity like that the rest of the morning or rest of the day. Mm -hmm. So when you get that bite, you need to capitalize on it and make hay while the sun's shining because it, it does not last forever. It doesn't, man. You know, that's, uh, so I've been down in the sound mainly and we're mainly trout fishing, still catching reds too, mi- mixed in with them, but it's, it's the exact same thing. You know, we're moving along and finding there's, there's some bait down there in the form of glassmen as everything's on these little bay anchovies or glassmen as I haven't seen any shrimp activity to speak of yet. It's going to start happening, but I haven't seen it yet. And uh, it's the same thing, just drifting along. I'm using, you know, the fish are slicking right now really well. So that, well, I say really well, they, you know, they do it. Sometimes you have to do it the old fashioned way and just start casting until you find them. But they, uh, they've been slicking really well. And that's been giving them away. We've been hitting these hot schools of trout. And I was telling Butch before we got you on that, you know, the numbers are no problem at all. The numbers have been phenomenal. You know, I ain't setting any state records and we ain't taking a whole bunch of pictures, but we're hitting a lot of fish in the boat. And, uh, you know, just, you know, it's kind of weird. You go from one day to the next fishing kind of roughly the same areas doing the same thing and just go from one day to the next. And it's amazing. Yesterday we had one of the, we had a great numbers day, but we had some of the best quality fish that we've had. And, probably since this spring as far as the number of quality fish we had a uh, trout i'm talking about and and then we had a really good top water trip because the guys just mate you know it's hard i know it's going to sound crazy because you know i like to top water fish but you know told me we were going to top water fish and not worry about putting corks on and uh and i said man that's fine with me but i'm gonna tell you i'm gonna keep one cork on because it's the only way we're going to get fish in the boat dang if we didn't catch them really you know pretty nice fish on top water you know so um and it was just because they made me do it you know and uh um I, but you know how we get man we get, his hand. well you know it, it's hard to, it's hard to sit here and say they forced me to top water fish because it's my favorite way to fish but you know i know what puts the fish in the boat this time of year I know exactly you know? and so mean. oh yeah but but it's you know it's exactly what you're talking talking about it's it's moving around until you're hitting these pockets of fish and and staying on them and then moving a little bit more and finding some more fish and sometimes you have to go ahead and crank the big motor up and move to a different area but it's the same pro you know it's the same procedure in that area so what's the uh, water quality like up there in the it's sound? great it's fine you know that the area that i'm fishing when you get west just west of the Dolphin Island Bridge, all the way to the Mississippi line, and then south out into the Sound, you've got to have some really, really high river stages for that to go bad. It was either last year or the year before we had a reading at Barry at 17 feet. That's the highest I've mm-hmm. ever seen. I remember. That was uh, near record levels, and that's the only time in Grand Bay I've ever mm-hmm. in my life, and I've been fishing down there forever in that area, that I've ever seen muddy water, ever. But when you get, you know, where we're, where we've been – and below i have more of the other problem it's you if you don't get wind or cloud cover and that sun gets up it gets tough because the water gets too clear you have to move off into a little bit deeper water because it gets too clear so i've been having the other problem and actually what i do i've been instead of moving to deeper water i've been moving back to the east back towards the bridge and the portersville area versus down towards the mississippi line and when the sun gets up a little bit or the wind quits because the water's a little bit more stirred up, which typically is the case over there, but it's, it's way high salinity. I've got big, you know, foam wake all the way, way Mm -hmm. back. So I got good salinity and, um, but, and that's the case. That's typically the case. Most of that, when you get, you know, 10 feet or below, most of that runoff goes out of the mouth of the bay. When you get right. start to get to 12 and above, you start to get some runoff down through start the sound. Backing up a little yeah. bit. Yeah, down through the intercoastal. But even on the north side and the south side of the sound, it stays clear. Yeah. And a lot of times that, that ends up being a lot of a wind-driven too, right? Oh, yeah, and, yeah. Um, like as long as you've got some – as long as you don't have a super, super strong – east wind to push it into the sound on an in what's the incoming tide put no outgoing tide when it starts pulling 
it moves to, yeah it moves from the east to the um, west on the fallen water but even in that case most of that is you'll get and we get predominantly a east component this time of year it's going to be east northeast mm-hmm. southeast this time of year and even then most of that runs down the true center of the sound like the intercoastal area versus like on the north you know the north side of the sound up into the grand bay system mar system yeah. and then on the south end even you can get you know south of the intercoastal and down along the you know west end of dolphin island even then you'll you'll still have clean water there so most of that is actually runs down the center of the sound and it doesn't affect you know the the edges of the sound until it starts getting way up in the teens you know which we're yeah. knock on wood we haven't gotten there and hopefully are not yep. going to get there yet this year yeah no doubt i hope not man yeah, i, hope yeah, it's I know and i keep thinking i'm going like come on man we're just a little <laughs> bit longer and we're, we're going to be out of this springtime deal you know i mean out of the springtime weather systems yeah i mean we did pretty good this year as far as um the way it's been the past couple of winters uh positive pat got us through that there was a couple of sketchy times there <laughs> I mean, I feel like it's been better than it has the past couple of years. We weren't singing the blues quite as bad. We just, I think we just got kind yeah. of lucky that that we did have more local rain and not so much up in the middle of the state. Don't y'all think? That's right. Yep. And I, oh, you know, and I was surprised too that we didn't get more from the flooding they had me, way north of us in the Tennessee. And I don't know how all that works, you know, in that Tennessee area, but they really got flooded up there. And I, I would have thought that some of that would eventually worked its way down here, but you know, to where, and that's what I was kind of holding my breath on, but again, keeping the, keeping my eye on the river stages, it doesn't show any kind of big major bubbles through like the weekends, you know what I'm saying? So mm. knock on wood, man, I, I'm hoping, you know, and it's we usually by the time we get into May and June, you're, you're pretty well done with all of that. You Great. Know? Yep. Yep. Let's uh, let's hope that. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was thinking about that the other day, Bobby, is if you look on that, if you look on those river charts, all of the, like the historical highs are typically like that January through April. Yep. And you rarely see, you rarely see any of those historicals in the, in the May or June or anything like that. So I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm pulling, for, I'm <laughs> pulling for this, uh, pulling for this drop and, and, con- and, and, and uh, get back to uh, get back to some normal levels because you know I was thinking about the other day as I was talking to a fellow at the at the ballpark and he was asking me about trout fishing and what did I think about the muddy water and everything and I was like you know typically I think like where trout should be anywhere expect just talking about like the eastern shore side of things anywhere from Daphne all the way to Fort Morgan I feel like there's trout there right now despite the low salinity and as soon as the water starts clearing up and getting better for us to be able to catch them they're there and they don't magically just appear no they don't and i agree with you i think that's not you know it's not just to the eastern shore i think it's the same thing on the on the other on the west side the exact same thing you're talking about and i had a conversation with someone the other day about the same thing is because they show up, it's like overnight, boom, you start catching them. Those yep. fish didn't swim up from the no. Gulf, you know, and you start catching them at Daphne Pylons or on the on the, uh, on the the docks over there or, or on the shoals by the bridge or something like that. They they literally will show up almost overnight, and, and so they're right around there somewhere. You know, they know what to do. They, mm-hmm. they You know, their salinity levels for them enough to survive, you know, so I think you're exactly mm-hmm. right. I, matter of fact, I know you are because it happens all the time, you know, you'll get, you know, whatever that number happens to be. And then you mix in a little proper wind direction and a good incoming tide and boom, you all of a sudden you start catching them, you know, and you're going like, well, they showed up. Well, no, they didn't show up. They've been here forever. You know what I'm saying? They, came from they just got close. to where we can actually catch them. So, you know, yeah. and I've said this forever too. And then we talk <clears> about it, you know, as we're during the dead of winter, when we get those, major runoff levels january and february and the, and the delta gets flooded out and we all go like well you know and the fish didn't go far they, they're somewhere around there and it was well they're they're in the uh they drop off in the ship channel they probably do the problem we got is we can't catch them right. i ain't nobody's figured out how to you know they probably do drop yeah. off there you know what i'm saying sure. it's the same thing in in the mobile river i think and, and i'm and this is me guessing because i don't have the experience that patrick does up there but you know you guys, and I'm talking about Patrick and the guys that are good up there. <laughs> it's like you, you know, that when you get like some heavy runoff and they quit catching them, and then it's almost all of a sudden, boom, they start catching them again. Yep. Them fish are they right around there. They're right around there somewhere. So it's exactly to <clears throat> what he's saying is is uh, they they're not going far. Trout just don't 
behave like that. They're, they're going to, they're going to be right around there somewhere. And, and again, it's, it's not going to be long. You're going to start catching them. Yep. Let me ask you this, Captain Bobby. I like catching those big speckle trout off the beach. Mm-hmm. That's fun. I've done it a couple of times. Not very good at it. Still learning it. What's going to be the next step to make that good? It, Are we looking at water temperatures or salinity like you're talking it, about moving in? Well, or? the good thing about over there is the salinity stays high. And the years that we've had these extreme runoff events is the years that the Gulf beaches have been really good. But I think there's a population of, I think throughout our entire system here, there's a populations of fish that kind of live or, or resident fish that are that are born there and grow up there and and stay in that general area. And I think that Gulf area is one of them. I don't think fish from the Mobile Delta swim down to the Gulf Beach. You know, um, I had a guy when I was a baby guide. Um, this guy, <laughs> baby this, guy. This guy. This guy. <laughs> I used to ask this guy all the time. He. This guy made. He was an older guide. He always, he lived on the Gulf beach. That's where all he did was croaker fish on the Gulf beach. And he was so good at it. And I used to ask him all the time. I said, where do those fish go? Cause they catch them during the summer, but right. he wouldn't catch them during the winter. And, um, I, I used to ask him, I said, where do those fish go during the winter? And he's going, Oh, they go out to the, they go out in the Gulf. They go out they live out in the Gulf. And I'm going like, this old guy's crazy. You know, <laughs> he don't know what he's talking about. And this is the truth. <laughs> says, I, I didn't mean to go off onto this tangent, but I have no, to finish this story. <clears throat> talking to these guys one time, they came up to me and this is, just how long ago this was they showed me a polaroid and they got a polaroid <laughs> of they you got young guys laugh at polaroids that's old guys are used to seeing polaroids, polaroids. anyway these guys showed me these polaroids and these were this was back when the, there was no season on snapper and, and you could catch snapper pretty much year round mm-hmm. and these guys had been rig fishing in 60 feet of water with ballyhoo and showed me uh, they had four speckled trout that were six, to, you know, guessing they were as long as their leg. They were six to seven pound speckled trout. Hmm. And the guy goes, Hey man, look at these speckled trout. We caught us. So where'd you catch me? He said, we caught them at a rig in 60 feet of water in January on Ballyhoo. And I went, <laughs> <laughs> said, and this guy had no reason to lie to right. me because he had a, bo- a bunch of snapper laid out right. with him, you know? And I'm going like, you know, maybe that old man wasn't so crazy maybe after all, so you know crazy. what I'm saying? So the That's point, wild. the point of the whole story is I think that there's, you know, to, to your original question, I think that like right now, you probably could go out on the Gulf beach and catch fish. The problem, the issue you're going to run into is what we're just talking about wind direction is you've got to be able to fish them and live, right? Because you go out there on a 25 knot Southeast wind and try and fish that Gulf Safe beach, it's right. going to be, it'll be like right. just that picture. Like your brother showed us a Dixie. Right. That's what the Gulf beach is going to look like. So it's the same thing we were talking about with the ship channel a little while ago is just because of there doesn't I mean, mean you can go catch them, them you know right. it doesn't do you any good if you can't catch them you yeah. know so you know you could go on the gulf beach probably now uh and i remember patrick and you may remember this one um years ago a few years ago when they used to do those uh alabama um i forgot what they call it but it was a state inshore championship or whatever they call it where you had to catch a speck of red and a flounder mm-hmm. and yeah. the husband and wife team and I, and I don't remember their names but the husband and wife good anglers went around on the outside of Katrina cut to catch redfish and caught their slam out there of speckled trout, redfish and flounder. And it was in January. Hmm. So, uh, and I can tell you this too, I caught speckled trout on more than one occasion, red fishing at the lighthouse with grubs in January. Hmm. So, you know, there's, there's fish that are staying in some of those areas. You just gotta be able to catch them. Yeah. You gotta be able to Conditions. fish them. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So, uh, I think, that like, again, getting back to your original question about the Gulf beach, I think you could probably go, if you had the right conditions, go there and catch them, right. Catch some fish right now. Hmm. I think it won't be long where, you know, if the river stages just keep dropping that some of the areas in the sound are going to be good. Like the, sh- the, you know, more up into the sound, like the shoals area. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when you told me that you had pretty water over there on the inside of Fort Morgan, it's it was probably beautiful. not going to be, well, not gonna be I mean, far it was beautiful away. compared to miss it or the mobile on the way yeah. out the bay, yeah. you know, it was, so, I mean, you could see your trolling motor as far down as it could go you could probably catch fish in there you know mm-hmm. what i'm saying right now so um because they're just not going far trout just don't move like that they don't right. you know make these big migrations the way for example big bull reds do you know mm-hmm. yes uh, patrick skipper sent me a picture from the escape a minute ago i guess they went out and did some uh some fishing today it was about 12 foot seas on dixie bar look like uh <laughs> <laughs> Look like North Point Oahu out there, dude. It was gnarly. He said it was an interesting day today. I said, Yeah, I see that. 
<laughs> Interesting. That's the thing about that Dixie bar too, is, you know, that when it's the best, which is now to me until about usually about June, it starts to slow down, you know, but like I catch them, you know, in the fall through now is, is as good as, but you, you got this, we were just talking about, you start getting that East and Southeast wind, especially two or three days of it, man, that Dixie bar looks, it can Sloppy. get treacherous out there, man. I mean, cause you got all those big rollers coming in from that deep water and then boom, it hits that shallow water and you get those big, <clears throat> big swells coming in i've had you guys have too man where he gets out there you get you know i get nervous out there sometimes the pucker like, factor gets a oh little, yeah, yeah you know you're sitting you know, i mean i've had the situation where easy. we'll yeah. have two fish on and have our back turned and then all of a sudden you hear yeah. and you turn around and there's it looks like One a wide five the, breaking yeah. you know breaking right next to your boat you know it's like yeah. you know so uh you still you know so getting back that you still got to be able to get out there to catch them and live while you're doing it you that's know? right all about yeah. condition all, all of he, all of all of the above is required to have a good day of that's fishing. right no <laughs> yeah. Doubt. yeah we gotta no catch doubt. fish and live all yeah right. all right man what else what else did we miss i think that, I think that about covers it it's a pretty good inshore segment anything y'all want to add man i'll tell you uh, well, yeah a whole bunch of stuff you know you get me going we're not gonna be here for another half an hour <laughs> when's wade fishing yeah i want to hit bobby with with the question because i'm like i still like I fish a good bit of Dolphin Island, but not a lot, and I don't really do much wade fishing. So when are you, when are you jumping out of the boat uh, and testing that bobo? Meter? Well, I'll tell you what, <laughs> you could do it right. You know, there's some places where I, you know, I've caught fish even earlier than this, and uh, you better. That's when you better have the waders. You know, it's it's right at that right now. It's at that point to where you know. Uh, I mean, I'm, I don't know about you. I'm still leaving in the morning with a sweatshirt and some long pants on and then eventually oh, finishing yeah. up with a pair of shorts and a, and, a, and a fishing shirt on, you know. But when it's that range right there, I'm still probably going to carry waders. But, you know, it's going to be any time now. The biggest trout I've ever caught in my life was on my wife's birthday, which is April 25th we were wading and on the West end of the, and that's about as early, even though I love that West end beach, I, I do that. That's my favorite fishing in the world. You know, I always push it early, but the, the telltale sign, at least down there, which is my favorite area to wade is when you start seeing those droves of mullet down there, usually that's believe it, it's usually on end of May before that gets like that. Hmm. So, uh, but there, that doesn't mean that there's not a, other areas you can't do it. You know, some of that, some of those areas in the sound with the right wind, it's a good shell bottom, the shoals when it clears up, you know, that's always an early place to get out and wade, you know, the Heron Bay area, uh, you know, around Portersville area, but so it's going to be any time I'm always pushing it, you know, um, a matter of fact, uh, my trip tomorrow was coming from out of town and has canceled because of the, and I'm kind of, I looked at my waders when I walked out of the group to come down here to Butch's house. And I said, you know, I think I'm going to throw those in my truck just in case yeah. tomorrow. And I, so I may go do it tomorrow, but it, it's any time now it's any time. But uh, again, I would highly recommend, you know, unless you're pretty tough, I don't like to wear waders unless I absolutely have to. Yeah. Um, that's my last resort or not last resort, but I, you know, I, I'll, I'll go and tough it out you know, and, and just hold my breath until the captain bobble meter touches the water, you know, but, right. you know, but usually once you get in and start, you kind of get used to it. The problem with waders, they're great when you're fishing. The yeah. problem is you if you've ever, back. you got to walk back <laughs> with, them, right. you know, and so, um, yeah. and I'm always the one that has to walk back, you know, so I, I, I don't like to wear them unless I absolutely have to, they're a pain in the butt, yeah. you know, when you have to walk back to the boat, you know, and I, the way I wade and you been with me i know mm -hmm. at least once but mm -hmm. i'll go a long ways you oh, yeah. keep moving until i find something that i i get carried away i'm going like, ah, man, that boat looks small back there wait a minute i just saw a mullet jump let me go a little further, a little further. yeah <laughs> five miles away yeah and then i'm going like oh man i gotta walk all the way back to that boat yeah that's right. when I'm praying. That's when I'm praying. I see somebody I know coming down in a boat and I'm flagging them down going like, hey, I need man. a ride. Yeah. I need an Uber. Yeah, I need an Uber. <laughs> Dale O'Brien picked Bobby, this. I want to, I want to go one, I want to go one more question into this wading conversation. What about, all right, you're jumping out of the boat, waders or not, whatever. What are a couple of, I mean, what are you going to, what are you going to tie on? Are you going to, you're just going to go slick lure, top water? What are you going to do? There? Always going to have a top water on first thing, always, without a doubt. It's like Butch and I were talking about, I think, again, I can't remember if we recorded this part too, but, you know, and you and I, I think this was you and I were even talking about this, is, mm -hmm. is I'm always going to have a top water on first thing because uh, I think you can, if not, even if the fish aren't on top water, 
you can get them to give themselves away, you yeah. know, and, yeah. and, and I love, I love topwater fishing. So I'm, I'm going to do that first thing. So I'm always, everything, everybody's going to have a topwater on when we get started. Then in my wade box, it's going to used to be mirror lures, but now my wade box is nothing but slicks. You can get everything done with slicks wade fishing. And the only other thing I might throw in there is some soft, like a regular jig, like a single hook jig. If you get into fish real thick and I don't want to, now that's the good thing about the slick lure now is you only have one hook to take out of mm-hmm. but back in the day when I was throwing mirror lures, you're having, you know, if you're throwing a catch 2000 or, or even a 52 series mirror lure, you're talking about two or three treble hooks and every trout was an adventure, oh, yeah. especially if you hook from it. his tail. Oh yeah. Spot and especially, if you, especially if you had a big <laughs> one and you had to net him because now you got all the hooks in the net too. Yeah. And uh, even using rubber line nets, they're, they're tough to get the hooks out. So I'm always, everybody's going to have top water on when we first get started and, and, and make a quick, you know, just depending on what happens, make a pretty quick adjustment just based on what the fish are doing. I like it. That's good stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, we went, uh, me, I remember we went, it was, I don't remember whenever me, you and Joe and Jay went, but I remember the water being so clear yeah. that, I mean, you know, we were up neck deep a couple of times and I mean, you could see your feet, no oh, problem. Yeah. Yep. And that's, and that's the way it gets a lot of times on that. And that's, that's the reason those days, I really like been a little later than this. Yeah. Might've been like May or June. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You'll if get, you're neck deep. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it was, I'm sure it was on into the summer, but you know, that's the thing about it too, is I like that. Uh, that's another reason getting in the water is to me is a lot more effective when you're dealing, you know, wading on hard sand or shells and clear water is it, I just don't have the success in some of those areas that I like to wade out of the boat that I do wade. And just because of that very reason, you're talking about super clear water and yeah. hard bottom and things like that. And not that you can't catch the school and fish out of the boat. I mean, in the boat, but when you want to catch the sure enough good ones that get on the edges of those bars and right on the beach, I, you just got to, to me, you got to get out of the boat and, and wade fish for them. Yeah. You know, they're just so spooky down there and they just won't bite nearly as well out of that boat. Yep. What else, Patrick? I don't, I don't know. Good segment. I, I think I've gave, I think I gave up about all I've been doing. Yeah. <laughs> gave up all your secrets. <laughs> yeah. Which sounds like a pretty heck of a good lot. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Tell you what, that's music to, uh, you know, when you get grown men that go, that's the best fishing trip of my life. That's music to your ears, dude. That's, that's right. a big compliment right there. Oh man. yeah. You know, that's right. Yep. <laughs> well, Captain Patrick, we appreciate you joining us, man. And I know your, your books must be heating up as well as the fishing that folks want to get up with you and book a trip. What's the best way to get up with you? Fastest, easiest way to check out my book is uh, uglyfishing.com. Uh, click the book now. And you'll be able to see my calendar in live uh, that is fully live. So if somebody's sitting there looking at the same date you are and they click on it before you do, then it will disappear. So missed out. It is, um, yep. <laughs> yep. They will miss out. I'm, I think I'm, I think I've got around uh, eight or 10 days left in June, a few left in July and already booking all the way into December. So that's awesome, man. Uh, that's awesome yep. to hear. I appreciate, uh, appreciate all our listeners, uh, man. I have, Mo, it, it's it's more and more common that that my 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 guests step on the boat saying you know repeating something I said on the podcast last week or the week before. So Heck yeah, um, we, I I really appreciate all of y'all as far as listeners that that support me and Bobby and Richard and um you know and supporting the podcast by listening. That's right, us too, man. We love it. It's uh, it's always fun. Like I say, there's been a couple times I've been at the launch and ramp fishing with you guys, and somebody will hear my voice or something and kind of perk up. And he's like, <laughs> "Hey, welcome to Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report." I'm like, "Yes, sir. That's right." <laughs> but nah it is cool man it's cool how much of a a tribe mentality we have here with our listeners man they uh they really show support and that's what uh that's what makes us successful yes sir all right buddy we appreciate the report and we'll talk to you soon captain patrick all right thanks guys y'all have a good one all right folks that's an awesome report from captain bobby and captain patrick Let's take a quick break and hear from this week's sponsors. The Alabama Marine Resources Division reminds all recreational anglers who harvest great triggerfish, greater amberjack, or red snapper that their catch must be reported through Snapper Check. This includes vessels, kayaks, and shore anglers who possess any of these reef fish. Reporting is mandatory and must be done prior to landing fish in Alabama, regardless of where the fish were caught. Anglers can report to Snapper Check online at OutdoorAlabama.com or through the official Outdoor AL app. For more information about Snapper Check or any of the 2021 fishing seasons, please visit OutdoorAlabama.com. 
and also brought to you by Advanced Transmission in Spanish Fort. Give the professionals a call who have been trusted on the Gulf Coast for over 25 years at 251-626-6061 or check them out online at www.advanced-transmission.com. All right, Captain Bobby, let's head on down and last but not least, let's head on down to see what Captain Dusty Hayes is up to. What you say, Cap? Oh, not much. I'm uh, just practicing my uh, surfing skills today instead of fishing because <laughs> it is rough for sure. Yeah, did you get blown um, off the beach yeah. this morning? I saw, a, saw a Snapchat from you earlier, something about headed to the beach, and it was about 20 minutes later, and you were headed the other way, Hoss. Yeah, it was it was forecasted to be a nice slick morning, and uh, or not, well, I wouldn't say slick, but two foot, you know, in a north wind, and that's what we call a, a prime surf after a little front coming through like that, uh, you know, uh, after a, a day after some rough weather all that food and stuff gets stirred up out there and it's usually a, a pretty exciting to fish even uh in the rain even i love fishing the rain this time of year no it turned out to be a wash there were some guys that fished though um uh, my buddy bun he fished down mobile street he caught some uh he said he caught a couple pompano and i think a black drum and some catfish of course and then um jeff and ramona they were in town they just rolled into town uh, yesterday and they fished uh, the state park today, and I know they ended up catching quite a few pompano, even though uh, it was it was rough. So, if you find an area where that sandbar cuts a little closer, you know those waves break far enough out where they don't have time to rebuild and break right there at your head. And I mean, it is fishable if you find the right spot. You know, the, I kind of called it quits just because you know with the popularity of of surf fishing nowadays, you know, if you really got to be where you want to be before the sun comes up. And by the time I got to where I thought I wanted to be and realized how rough it was, it was kind of too late to make a move. You know, you can maybe get lucky and people will stay home, but it's uh, it's been a lot of people fishing the beach over here and a lot of people catching fish. So you, know, you definitely got to kind of pick and choose your times and go early in the morning and, and even, you know, afternoon bites a great time to, to go. It's something that's really not messed with as much by a lot of people, but I think the afternoon is very overlooked. Even on bad tides, you know, we've had a neat tide earlier this week in the outgoing part in the afternoon, and there's still guys catching a lot of pompano in that. And that is pretty much, you know, if there's two things you don't want for pompano surf fishing, it's a neat tide and an outgoing tide. And people are catching them on both. You know, that's a good sign that the fish are there for sure. So, uh, but it's been it's been good. A lot of good numbers of fish still. Um, you know, there's still a mix of, of plenty of redfish and black drum and people catching Spanish and bluefish. But the uh, the whiting bite has been really, really good. I mean, everywhere from Johnson's Beach and Pensacola Beach through, you know, Fort Morgan. And guys catching not just, you know, I wouldn't say crazy numbers of like, you know, 50 or 60, but a lot of guys catching you know, a dozen or more and a lot of really big fish, you know, 14 to 15, 16 inch fish, all the way up to 18, 19 inch fish very regularly. And they're fat, full of eggs. And uh, after this little full moon, we had a lot of the pompano are still here. And a lot of them are smaller. And I noticed, you know, a lot of people kind of got discouraged after that first week of the pomp stomp. You know, we had a lot of fish weighed in and a lot of big fish weighed in. And, you know, we were right in that full moon that first weekend. So there's a lot of three plus and four plus found fish. And a lot of people bringing in fish now that are, you know, two and a half to three and a half and, you know, pushing four. And, you know, you got to remember those fish, you know, that first weekend were, were fat and, you know, they were full of eggs and a lot of these fish are a little thinner right now, but we do have another full moon phase coming up at the end of the month. Those fish will pick up some more weight before the tournament is over. So if you're fishing the pomp stomp and you're kind of stuck in that two to three pound range, you know, don't, don't get discouraged, you know, just keep at it. You know, you'll, you still got a solid chance of, of catching that big fish it's anybody's game really especially with there's still you know three and a half weeks or so or more in the tournament so um but it's been it's definitely been on fire over here you know weather permitting if you can find a decent day which most days have been fishable for the most part whether it's been a cold front or rain or whatever everybody's catching fish so it's it's been awesome it's a good time of year over here for sure dusty have y'all caught uh, have y'all caught any uh any more permit yet this spring no, you know, I actually haven't seen a lot this spring. Um, it seems, you know, in my experience, we seem to catch a lot more in the, like, summer, late summer especially, and definitely in the fall. Like, I catch 90% of the ones I think I've caught as far, you know, the best of my knowledge have all been, I want to say, like, August to Christmas. You know, like, it seems that that fall is when we catch a lot of them. You know, but what I have seen is, like, April, May, we do see a bonefish get caught. Uh, I would say regularly, but I definitely saw uh, some of that. Last yeah, uh, it's crazy. Yep, 
uh, I think it was last year, the year before, me and Matt and Caleb and Brett with Fish Bites, we were fishing on the beach when we had that little uh, weekend tournament. I'll say it was the year before last. And uh, we caught one, and that was in May. And then uh, Matt's caught a few others. I think I've been twice with Matt when he's caught a bonefish. And then um, I want to say both in May. And then my buddy Brandon, he actually caught a 15-incher uh, fishing somewhere down Fort Morgan. I don't know if it was Mobile Street or further. See, that was Sunday morning. He caught a 15-incher, which is well, a decent little bonefish. So. Yeah, for sure. You would think they would – I guess they follow the, the warmer waters up. Well, the, in the, you know – Gulf Stream's not far offshore. Well, I say not far. It's quite a ways offshore, I guess, at times. But, you know, anything's possible. You know, you look at, for sure. like, Josh, you know, he caught that yellowtail offshore a few years ago. Um, that was, like, 10 pounds, you know, less than 10 miles out. And, you know, like most people think big yellowtail, you think the key is automatically. Same thing mm-hmm. with permit, same thing with bonefish. So, yep. you know, our, our fishery our fishery can support these you know, different fish that aren't necessarily, you can't say non-native because it's the Gulf, but non-native to our, you know, region. Region, yeah. But, um, you know, if the if the water's warm and the bait's there, the structure's there, I mean, there's no reason why they shouldn't be there, you know. So, obviously, things are changing in our area. And, you know, after a, after a while, I think you'll see a bunch of different fish start to be caught in our area, like especially the snook, like there's been snook pop up here and there. I think back in the fall or winter, somebody caught a decent snook in Pensacola somewhere. Yep. Um, so, I was, I mean, it's, I, that's the next thing I was going to ask you about my, but I got a buddy of mine that's on the Skeeter team. That's a guide or you may know Daryl Combs. He, uh, he co- texted me a picture. It's probably been about two years ago. He caught a, uh, a snook in Wolf Bay. And he, and he texted me the picture of it. And he said, look what I caught. And I said, I said, no, you got this. Uh, he goes, do you know what the uh, size limit is? I said, there ain't no size That's limit on it. I said, you got the state record. That's right. He's let it go because he didn't know what the size limit. But <laughs> oh, so th- what I was getting at what was going with all, when you were talking about that, I was wondering, you know, you're talking about these, these, uh, you know, these fish that are really more, you know, known to be like in the, you know, the, the Southern climates of the Gulf, Southern is the Gulf, South Texas, South Florida, how much you'd heard about snook. And, and it's like, you read my mind because as soon as I was thinking it, it came right out of your mouth about snook. So it's, it's some snook have been caught up our way over the last few. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm pretty sure yeah, I saw I know, one in Mobile uh, Bay last year. Really? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, well, not me. Yeah, I, pe- yeah, I saw yeah, a I picture of somebody that. caught one. Yep, I think I heard that, and uh, I'll, I'll have to – I'll check with Chris because me and him are talking about it. And I want to say – I mean, it was several months ago. It was, But it was somewhere in Pensacola. I don't know if it was Pensacola Bay, Pensacola Pass, but it was a decent fish. It wasn't a right. it wasn't a small one. I mean, it was a decent fish for sure. I mean, those things happen. And, and I, you know, just to kind of clarify, too, I always try to, like, you know, push it to everybody. You know, if it's something that, you know, you're not sure what it is or you're not sure regulation, let it go. You know, same thing with like those little bonefish and permit on the beach. Like, you know, even though the permit, they don't have regulations in Orange Beach and they're a common catch, you know, just let the things go. I mean, you know, that's that's the only way we can ever establish a population is to let things go. You know, like if somebody catches a, a snook, you know, you got to think that might be the only one for 100 miles you know maybe there's a couple more but if you kill it you just killed half that population you know? <laughs> yeah so, that's right um, maybe, literally yeah or maybe or maybe all of it or maybe all of it yeah, so, yeah. you know that, that's you know, you and, and I'll talk, you know, you know like all that. fish are schooling to some extent. You know, I guarantee you, they're not the only, the only one right there. There's, there were some other Gotta ones around. Some more. Yeah, there's, yeah. yeah, may not be a bunch of them, but they, the he, he, that, that snook or that permit didn't swim up here by himself. No, nah, you know? he wasn't the lone ranger. No, no, no I, I, uh, yeah, I agree. And I, I believe that, you know, looking at the size of a lot of these bonefish and permit that we catch in the surf, I think that they, it's just like a lot of things that they, they're, whenever whatever spawn happens that their eggs and stuff and hatchlings end up in the northern gulf and in they if the water's warm enough they'll stay because especially like november december you see so many uh, permit that are just i mean like hand size but you know we see the pompano like late summer and midsummer that size from the spring spawn and you know they're all three four five six inches and you see them all over the place like you go in the summertime and there'd be thousands of pompano chasing your lure back uh, and they're like a school of bait because they're just aggressive little fish. And, you know, as you get late fall and it starts getting cool, you notice that same thing with a permit. You got a lot of these, like, I mean, size of your palm, size permit. And so that means that they're, you know, three, four, five, six months old. So, you know, those fish are ending up here somehow. And the same thing with the bonefish. Majority of the bonefish have been, obviously, there's been a couple of decent ones caught, but the majority of them seem to be 
smaller, you know, so a lot of them, I would say seven, eight inches. So I think that a lot of that, the, the baby fish, the, you know, two, three, four month old fish end up here, or maybe they hatch here in our base system and grow up and work their way we, out. We were, we were just um, having just, this same conversation about speckled trout in yeah. our area, which obviously is a, is a, is a native fish here, but, um, we, and I think you're exactly right. I think what happens is if they're, they're spawned here, they get acclimated to the environment here and yep. as, as opposed to being in, you know, water temperatures that are 80 and 90 degrees all year long. And I think that's probably, I think you're exactly right. I, just you, I don't know anything at all about permit <laughs> me either, but, but just but spawning, it's, adapting, it, you know, and it makes acclimating. sense hearing what he's sure. saying, because I, I know for a fact that that i well, I know, I don't know for a fact, but I'm just, I'm pretty dang sure that at least with trout, which is something I know, know about is I think that what happens is they are, they are born in an area they're they grow up in an area and they pretty much stay in the area and it makes sense. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Exactly what he's yeah. saying. I think it just goes just exactly establishing what, we, a, what we were just talking about with, with trout a little while ago. Yep. It know? does. Agreed. I think you're, yeah, and, I think you're exactly right. Yeah. And you look at stuff like, you know, you go down to way South Florida, they get these cold snaps where it gets, you know, a whopping 50 degrees and there's speckled trout dying <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. Well, you know, you come, you come here in January and we're trout fishing in 30 degree weather and that water temp can be down in the low fifties or lower. So, I mean, you know, this, our, our fish are definitely a lot more acclimated to that. Same thing with, you know, like juvenile tarpon and stuff like that in our areas that, you know, they're yep. not supposed to live below a certain point, but, you know, they're, they're fish that survive it, you know. And, yep. and they um, do. So that I think, I, yep. And so I think it's just a matter of uh, where they're born, how they how they accustomed to it. And it's, a, it's definitely genetic and it's passed on and they learn to, you know, live with it and, you know, kind of grow up with it and yep. adapt and overcome for sure it's a cool fishery we have here it is and i and like you're saying i think i think with things showing up that way i mean i think we can sustain it here it doesn't get too too cold it'll be interesting to see as far as the bone fish and the and the permit and who knows what else will show up yeah yeah who knows man <laughs> um i got out over came and saw you last week over at sam's i got out and did a little surf fishing myself man one of the biggest things that i was running into is, and i know i don't have great surf equipment I don't even have great trout equipment. But I brought my, uh, I brought my, you know, my trout, my trout poles, and it was about two or three foot. Man, what's your, what's your ideal rod size for casting and getting up over those wave tops? I was having a really hard time casting as far as I thought I needed to, and then my line, you know, would dip down in those wave tops, and the grass would get on the line, and yada <laughs> yada yada. So just kind of walk me through your setup, if you don't mind. Yeah. So a few critical things, definitely a longer rod, and you know you don't have to have a bigger rod to have a longer rod and i know that sounds kind of gross but uh that being said we sell rods at the store and there's plenty of different rods that you can get like we refer to as steelhead rods that they use up north for steelhead trout yeah and i know we've talked about it before but yep. these rods are going to be anywhere from eight to ten feet but they're still light action rods a lot of them are only rated up to an ounce some of them uh, maybe up to two but most of them are like one or I'd say half ounce to like three quarter ounce, like very small area, but we can throw one to one and a half ounce sinkers on them, no problem. But you have a eight and a half, nine foot rod that gives you that little extra length to get that line over that breaker. Um, a big thing is having a long enough surf, surf spike. I make all my sand spikes myself just because it's hard to find a pre-made one that's under 40, 50 bucks that's long enough. So like I'll use schedule 40, I'll yeah, cut that makes my own sense. Uh, about 45 inches and then you know with that long butt section on your rod you can put it at an angle in that rod holder and you can really get that line over that wave another thing that helps too i, I prefer braided line because it's going to be thinner mm -hmm. so if that wind's blowing southwest southeast or just hard east hard west um, it's going to keep you from getting as much of a bow in your line and you'll be able to keep that line a little more taut um, as far as just your, you know, bigger stuff goes, like your bigger surf rods, a lot of guys will start at eight to nine feet and then work your way up to, you know, 10, 11, 12. Anything past, in my opinion, 11 is really not necessary. There are times where you can use a 12 footer and get that extra distance, but I'm not going to say it's something that you got to have. Like I said, there's times where like today, yeah, you'd want the 12 footer that can throw a five or a six ounce to get out there. And you might be the only guy fishing. you have definitely going to be the only guy catching fish, but right. um, our local Few surf here, yeah. you know, yeah, our local surf here, like I, I tell this to people all the time because people are like, oh man, I got to have Sputnik sinkers and all that stuff. And those things cost four or $5 a pot. If I, if a three ounce pyramid ain't holding, I'm ready to go to the house. Cause that means it's <laughs> blowing, you know, 
But uh, it's it's bowling fifteen plus at that point, and I just don't want to fight <laughs> it. I'm not that mad at them. Now, you know, another in the spectrum, yeah. There's times where a Sputnik sinker will hold that current really well, and you know, it, it may just be the ideal thing. But you know, with the your average surf rod, nine to ten to eleven feet, you know, most of them are going to be rated like uh, one to four, two to five, stuff like that. That allow you to throw a two or three ounce with ease, and get that extra distance, and get that height above those waves. Um, and that longer rod definitely helps your casting and get that that cast it further. But proper casting technique, to me, outdoes the rod. Um, you can give somebody that really knows how to cast a crappy rod and reel, and they'll outcast somebody with a you know four set the four to seven hundred dollar setup that doesn't know what they're doing all day long. Hmm. You know, now obviously having nice stuff helps, but knowing how to cast properly makes a huge difference. You know, you see a lot of guys that do the old sideways throwing a Zepco with a uh, bobber and a worm cast, and you know there's it'll get a bait out there, but there's no accuracy and you're definitely not getting the distance you can get um, proper surf casting. And there's th different ways you go up and down the East coast. And uh, then the Texas, there's different ways people cast. Some guys use conventional, some guys use spinning, but having a, you know, baseline proper casting technique uh, and learning how to load that rod and when to release that sinker to get the furthest cast goes a long ways. And any, it's something anybody can learn. I've taught seven and eight year olds with, you know, 11 foot rods and they're slinging it as far as I can. So it's just something you got to get somebody, you know, to show you the proper way or get on YouTube, whatever it may be to really get that technique down. And that'll get you that further cast. It don't matter if you're using a trout rod or if you're using a 12 foot rod, your, your casting distance is going to improve just by learning to cast properly. Dusty, uh, pardon my ignorance here, but man, uh, what, what is a Sputnik sinker? Sputnik sinkers, uh, I mean, they got other names for them too. Um, but basically it's like a, it's almost like a teardrop, like a bass caster lead, but it's got these four arms, metal arms that, that come out of it. And those arms dig down in the sand. Oh, hold you in place. So, oh I didn't know that's what they were called. Oh, okay. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then when you go yeah. to retrieve them, yeah. When you go to retrieve them, those sinkers, they'll pop down and, and allow you to reel it in with ease instead of dragging those wires all the way back. Right. Um, you know, they, they do good. It's good to hold you in a current, but sometimes, you know, if there's too much current, they'll bury up and it'll bury your baits with it. And if your baits a couple inches underneath the sand, then you're definitely not catching fish. So. Right. Yeah. Butch pulled up some pictures of them as you were telling me. And as mm -hmm. soon as you start explaining, yeah, cool. I never knew that's what they were called, man. Yeah. Thanks. Just learned something else from the podcast, yep. man. I learned a ton about yeah. surf fishing and I realized how much I did it. Last I know, weekend, man, I'm sitting here listening to, to this. I'm going like, why didn't I bring my notepad right well, here, man? Whenever I went to trial last week, we caught, I caught, I caught some nice whiting. I think our first evening out, we caught probably 10 or 12 nice whiting, which I thought was a success, but oh, no yeah. pompano. Dusty, I stopped by Sam's and I got some sketchy guy there named Dusty makes some rigs and puts them in a little Ziploc bag and he sells them. Do you <laughs> like, do you, do you like the two hooks or the one hook? Or do you, do you feel like one is more successful for Pompano or one is more successful for whiting or when do you go one or two hooks? That is deep. I personally like the ones and, and as far as a pre-made rig you can buy somewhere that's hand tied i don't know of anybody else that makes a one drop i hate saying that now because i'm so busy i don't have the time to tie anymore and i don't think i got many left but i like my one drops for certain reasons and there's also plenty of reasons to use a two i'll just try to keep it brief but my biggest thing on a one drop is like on a rougher day like today that leader is going to be a lot shorter overall. And I always get a further cast with that shorter, you know, overall rig. And um, I have less drag because I don't have a second hook and a second float and a second bait flying in the air and killing that cast. Now, if it's, you know, moderate surf light wind, then you can throw a two drop rig just as far. So there's a, you know, pro and con situation there. Another thing with the two drop though, where it, it has its benefits. If, if you're in a situation where you're not really keyed in, like, hey, I don't know if ghost shrimp are working or if pink fish bites is working or if sand fleas are working or if sand flea fish bites is working, you have, you know, say you fish four rods, well, you have the option to fish four baits there. You can do two different color fish bites or three different yeah. color fish bites or a piece of shrimp and a sand flea. Which is what you I can was alternate doing. That and, yep, yep. And you can change it however you want. And sometimes, it don't matter what it is. It, they'll hit everything. And I tell people this all the time because they always ask, oh, what's the best color rig? And then they'll be, I'll be like, man, it don't matter. You know, you just got to buy a couple and play with it. And then they're like, 
well, come on, tell me the best color. I'm like, man, if there's the best color, I would only carry one. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's uh, it. And I wouldn't carry, I, I wouldn't carry all 15 of them. Right. And you know, everybody has their personal preference, and and a lot of that changes watercolor. It changes, you know, whether you're further west down Fort Morgan, that water can be very dingy down there. And then if you're fishing in Johnson's Beach or like East Orange Beach, that water can look like the Bahamas down there. So, you know, that's where different colors for different water clarities help. Back to the one drop, like I said, I like the one drop because I feel like I get a further cast. If I am using natural baits like sand flea or ghost shrimp, I'm not slinging as much bait off. And I mean, it don't matter who you are, how good you are, you're going to sling a bait off. So I don't feel like I'm wasting as much bait. And also, too, if I'm catching fish consistently and I'm really kind of keyed in on a float color or a bead color or an exact bait that, I, that they're really eating, then I like that simply for the fact that I know I'm not wasting as much bait. And two, as fun as it sounds, if you hook two stud pompano, the chances of landing both of them can mm. slim more and more and more the closer you get to that shoreline. And it's not an uncommon thing to hook a, a red and a pompano at the same time or a whiting and a pompano. I've caught flounder and pompano. I've caught baby cobia and pompano on the same time. And a lot of times it works out where you catch that double. But, man, I've also lost a lot of big pompano right there at the shoreline. I got two of them on and they're two, three, four pound fish and they're fighting each other and they decide to go the other way. And, you know, yeah. one of them's going to pop off. Now, that being said, you still land a fish, but you got a fish with a hook in your, in its face and possibly dragging around a lead. You know, it's, it's not a super common thing, but it's just one of those things that prevents two fish getting on as it gets warmer too. You notice like more lady fish, more blue fish, more juvenile jacks and stuff like that. You know, if you got ladyfish thick in the surf and you're fishing shrimp, man, not only are you going through a ton of bait, but you're hooking two ladyfish every time and you're just going to be tearing through leaders True. left and right. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, there's pros and cons to both. I wouldn't say there's a better. Uh, it's really personal preference. Up close whiting fishing, though, I'm going to take a, a one drop over a two drop any day, no doubt. But as far as your longer casting for pompano, it, it just it's kind of a bulls down to personal preference. There's definitely pros and cons to both. All right, man, that's a perfect segue into our Hey Cap segment. And uh, Phil brings us a, bre- a great question this week. We have all reviewed Phil's last name, and we're going to take guesses at uh, <laughs> how to pronounce it. What do you I think, Captain pronounce- Bobby? I, I was going to say Salingue. What do you think, Dusty? I'm going to say Salingue. Salingue, I like that. I think it's going to be on, Phil bro. Salingue. Phil, whoever gets the closest to your last name. Wait, you gets just a... said it the way I said it. You Did can't, I... yeah. <laughs> huh. Phil. What'd you say, Dusty? Oh, hell, I don't remember now. <laughs> Phil S. We're going to, yeah, yeah, I thought Butch was going to cop out and go, Phil S. <laughs> That's right. Well, now I am. All right. Phil S. brings us a great question. He submitted it over on our Best Fishing Report Facebook page. Phil asks, what is the best method for targeting flounder from the beach and what time of day to do so? Figured you'd be a good one for this one, Dusty. What you think? Yeah, so as far as time of day, I'm definitely going to say early morning. And it, a lot of that's going to depend on where you're at. Now, early morning, the first reason I say that is because our Alabama beaches and a lot of, you know, beaches along the Gulf Coast can be heavily populated with swimmers and, you know, beachgoers and all that stuff. So early in the morning, those fish have come in, you know, overnight and they're, you know, hunting in the surf and and by hunting they're ambush predators. But, you know, they're hanging out in the surf as that sun gets higher you know, they'll ease their way out to deeper water to prevent getting, you know, chased by predators, birds, whatever it is. And also people stomp around in the surf. Now, certain areas of beach, you know, say you find a little area of beach that really doesn't have a lot of pressure from, you know, people walking and beachgoers, then, you know, they may be out there later on in the day. Now, that being said, it seems like starting here, you know, here through, I would say, in the next month or so, all the way till uh, November, December, you'll get flounder in the surf for sure. And I really like to cover ground when targeting them. You know, a lot of guys will do just kind of set up and fish them. And, and if you're fishing around structure, like there's some little structures on the beach down Fort Morgan, there's some in Perdido Key. Uh, you know, you got West Pass and Perdido Pass and Orange Beach and Gulf Shores. And if you're fishing around structure, you know, kind of fishing more stationary with a live bait like a finger mullet or a bull minnow, croaker, stuff like that is, is very productive if you're in a heavily area with a lot of fish presence, put it that way. I think the best way to do it, though, is definitely walking the beach, throwing lures, you know, targeting them. Um, you know, flounder are ambush predator. Uh, they're 
pretty much stationary waiting on something to come by them and they're going to eat it, especially if the opportunity presents itself where it's like the perfect scenario where they're not going to turn it down. That's why, you know, I'm convinced like if you cross your lure or if your lure cross paths with a flounder, they're going to eat it. And almost no matter what it is, it's simply because if it's right in front of their face, they're not going to turn it down. To me, one of the best methods is what we call fan casting. So you're going to cast, you know, to pretty much as far left as you can to all the way to your far right, you know, and you can have or you know, left, right, right to left, whatever works for you. Uh, and look for small holes where that sandbar comes in close along the beach and cover those areas. Now, there's also places where, you know, along the beach where, you know, that sandbar may be at 100 yards and those fish will be scattered out in that deep water, especially in the fall when there's a heavier presence of flounder in the surf. I say that as if, you know, there's also be plenty in the summer too sometimes. But uh, definitely lures are going to be the go-to in my opinion. Now, there's quite a few different rigs you can try. Uh, I think actually last time I talked about the John Skinner rig, Bobby mm-hmm. was on here with us. Yep, I remember. Yep, and that was when I was in Atlanta last year. But uh, and that's just a basic uh, bucktail jig on the bottom, and that can vary from like a small like pompano jig from a half to three-quarter to one-ounce pompano jig up to like a – uh, like a little Berkeley Fusion or Spro bucktail jigs, you know, half to one ounce. And usually people are going to tip that with a cut bait of sorts or uh, like a piece of fish bites, piece of squid, um, anything like that is going to work good and even gulp. And then usually above that, you know, six to eight to inches to even to a foot, people have a small all-purpose hook or a small O'Shaughnessy hook with a gulp on there or, you know, whatever scented plastic you like. And that's a proven rig, especially if you're fishing a little deeper, more turbulent water, something I like. You know, one of the, to me, the all-time favorites, especially in our area, is, you know, the, the Chris Vecce special, the little paddle tails, pre-rig paddle tails or tsunami. There's Pat Berkeley power baits. There's quite a few. I know he's partial to the tsunamis, but uh, all the tsunami stuff's kind of tough to get right now because of COVID. Um, there's plenty of alternatives, but basically just a pre-rig paddle tail swim bait that already have the weighted hook and uh, inside of them, um, they're flat bottom, so they swim real well along the surf line. And something else that I'm actually excited about this year, Gulp came out with a couple new colors uh, in their swimming mullet uh, in like pearl with chartreuse tail, which is a huge flounder color, especially in the fall. fall. And they also came out with a uh, paddle tail now, which I'm not, a, like I said, I'm not really a Gulp fan, but if I'm flounder fishing, I don't mind buying a pack of Gulp. And those little paddle tails, man, they're sweet, and they make some really cool colors, especially the silver mullet color. It's kind of holographic. And then uh, another thing that we just got into the shop yesterday that we've been uh, kind of anticipating is the Hoagie Slow Tail three-quarter and one-ounce baits. And, um, you know, we sell a lot of Hoagies. We use them for everything from trout fishing Mm -hmm. to flounder fishing off the beach all the way up to tarpon fishing. Yeah. But man, those they now make the slow tail, which is the twin double tail, all the way down to like a three and a half inch, three quarter ounce bait, and it is going to be an absolute surf flounder killer this year. Um, we we doubled up on them just because you know it's going to be if the flounder show up in the surf, this is going to be the lure to throw for sure. And we definitely got the, the solid colors. We got pearl and we got chartreuse and, and some other natural colors. But, you know, just walking, fan casting, as far as I said, time of day, I think early morning's good. If you're in an area that doesn't get as much foot pressure, those fish will move back in uh, right before dark. And if you're in, you know, certain times of the year, once it starts getting cooler and, you know, nobody's really been on the beach in a day or two or, if, you know, it's been rough weather and there hasn't been a lot of people swimming and stuff, then, yeah, you may find them, you know, pinned up in there all day long. Like I said, for the most part, I like to fish early. It seems like they're kind of, they stay in there overnight and then they'll work their way out as the sun gets higher. That makes sense, man. That's a, that's a great hey cap question. Phil, S-A-L-I-N-G-U-E, <laughs> Phil Saling. I think I'm going to go with Saling. Anyways, <laughs> Phil's going to get a prize pack from the yeah. Slick Lure. Phil, make sure you email us at alabama at bestfishingreport.com to redeem your Slick Lures. You guys make sure you're following the Best Fishing Report page over on Facebook and join that private group, Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report. Captain Dusty, great report, great hay cap question. If folks want to get up with you and book a trip or come pick your brain about tackle or any of the assortments of above, what's, your, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, if you uh, need to call or text me, it's uh, my number is 678-897-0167. Um, that's really the best way to get in touch with me. And then if you you know need any help with tackle or anything like that, you can find me at Sam's Stop and Shop in Orange Beach, and we can help you out with anything surf-related or offshore, inshore, all that stuff. But uh, like I said, if, you, if you're if you fishing the pump stomp, too, bring it back up. I know, am. Don't I actually, actually bought a ticket. Still, 
Yep, yep. There's still a lot of time. It's anybody's game, you know. It's, but those those big numbers were quick for sure. Um, but I mean, there's there's still a lot of good fish being caught. There's still a lot of fish that's going to be caught. So everybody keep at it. And um, it's cool to see how many people have entered this year. We got a huge number. We we not only broke the record, but we you know more than tripled it really. And so it's, it's it's awesome to see how many people are participating in it for sure. It's great to hear, man. Great to see. Great to see people getting out and expanding their horizons of fishing, or maybe just getting into fishing in general. We love that. Absolutely. All right, Dusty, we appreciate the report, buddy. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Yes, sir. That segment was brought to us by SunSouth. When it's time to tackle projects on your property, come see us at SunSouth. We offer John Deere equipment ready to tackle any project that comes your way. From moving and mulching to planting and picking, our team at SunSouth will help you find the equipment to meet your needs. And right now at SunSouth, get 0% financing on select John Deere equipment. Plus, receive additional bonus cash on qualifying trade-in equipment. Come see us at SunSouth. Equipment for those that do. Some restrictions apply. See dealer for details. Expires April 30th, 2021. And also brought to you by Test Calibration. If your diesel has low power or is consuming excessive amounts of fuel, these are common signs that your turbocharger may need to be rebuilt. Don't waste your money online with the cheapest options where you get no support after the sale. Test Calibration has been selling and servicing diesel, turbochargers, and fuel injection systems since 1976. No matter if you're running a diesel in your boat, tractor, or truck, Test Calibration can help you. Contact them at 800-822-0057 or visit them online at testcalibrationdieselandturbo.com. All right, Captain Bobby. That's another great Alabama saltwater fishing report, man. That's some good information. Good information. You know, one of the things is, and I, and I probably have said this when I've been on before hosting with you, is uh, you got to li- read between the lines or listen between the lines. Oh, yeah. You know, when we get uh, – we, we start talking about what you learned. If you really listen closely, there's some interesting stuff going on. Patrick, for example, is talking about fishing when he started talking about fishing, the clarity, or in his case, lack thereof clarity, Mm -hmm. you know, and I got, I'm old timey trout fisherman. We were, you know, we used to say, if you couldn't see the the lower unit, it was too muddy to, to fish. Mm -hmm. And we would, and, and, and I've learned since then that there's ways to overcome that. But the point being, he was talking about fishing a few inches of water clarity and still catching a bunch of fish, you know? So, uh, that was one of the things I really picked up from him that, you know, if you're listening to things like this, you know, and he just kind of casually mentioned as he was going into the great report, he had, uh, you know, about, how little clarity he had, but he was still whacking the fish, you know? And then the other thing, when Dusty was talking about, on the hey cap question when the fella asked him phil phil asked phil, him, phil asked, yeah <laughs> phil s asked him about the time of the day to catch flounder i'm thinking the first thing am i thinking myself is exactly what uh, dusty said when you got an ambush feeder he's going to feed us especially if you're fishing the beach with no ambient light you're going to be he's going to be right. trying to feed as soon as he can see something so in my mind i'm like i'm not even a beach fisher but i'm thinking well an ambush feeder is always going to be feeding as soon as he, you know mm-hmm. so first light super early super early yeah so i'm saying first light is going to be the best so i'm thinking myself and he touched on that but he also said yeah you got to get there before the people start swimming and i'm going like <laughs> i never would have even thought of it yeah we like talk that. about boat traffic well, yeah we think time. i think in terms of boat traffic you know but but i'm going like gosh so he's got like a double whammy there he wants to be there you know when they're which you know, from a fishing standpoint you know we know right uh but the other thing i would, I would have never even thought of that yep. you know you, and, combat uh, it. you know so you know the whole point of the thing is what, it, you know, it, it, you really have to listen to some of this. You can pick up some real subtle things that are very, very important yep. that guys like Dusty and Patrick that'll throw out there because they don't even think about it. They've right. already dialed in on this so well that they don't even think about it. But if you listen to those little subtle Just casually things, mentioned, yeah, you know, we yeah. all want to go like, what bait do we want to use or where do I want to go or, you know, whatever. Um, that's the, you know, and very, very, very obviously very important aspects. But sure. when you start throwing little subtle things like that well, in there. And the more and more that I get to fish with you guys and just fish in general, it makes me a much better host. But like when I was asking Patrick, you know, he was fishing, 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 and he'd whack 15 in a row, you know, yeah. put the poles down. Well, why? Yeah. You know, why, why, why were those fish there? Can I go catch those fish? <laughs> no, not, not latitude and longitude numbers, but why were those fish there? Was it shell bottom? Was it X? So I just try and pick up on things all the time. And I often I catch, I catch multiple things after I listen to the show, after, you know, our producer, John, or sends it, sends it to me for approval. I catch things all the time that I'm like, oh, I didn't even hear him say that. Yeah. I was messing with the outline or, you know, you just never know. You get busy. But, 
Yeah. I'll There's learn. some great information on this. And I know I've said that before too, and it's really, really great information. And obviously that's, you know, uh, you know, congratulations to you and Joe for starting this, but uh, that's why we have, you have so many listeners is um, the word's gotten out on this thing and it's very educational. You can listen to it at your leisure, yep. pick the parts you want to listen to. And, um, and, yep. but there's a lot to learn and you can really learn a lot. I, when I get a chance to be on here, when I listen to it, I'm going, man, that's some good stuff right there. You yep. know? And it always, it always is with everyone. Everybody's, mm-hmm. it cuts the learning curve. I mean, oh I, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's cut years off my learning curve <laughs> going with you guys a few times and, and listening every week, just keeping my finger on the pulse, you know? Yep. Yep. It's no good doubt. stuff. And it's timely stuff too. Doing it once a week like this. It's, it's always time, good, timely have to. information you changes know? Yep. day to oh, day. Man, I mean, tell me much about less it. week to week. Yeah. You know? Especially these transitional periods, these spring and fall to me is when you really have to pay attention to what's going on. You get this established wintertime deal or summertime deal. They're pretty well doing the same thing for right. several months, for right. a couple months. This time of year, man, it, it, like you just said, it changes from one day to the next. It's amazing. How like we saw changes. from yesterday. To you today. Start, yeah. And you start throwing in issues and not even just water temperature we start now you start talking about river runoff and salinity, salinity levels yep. and things like that that's a big part of the equation that you have to pay attention to when you're when you're doing this during the during these transitional periods especially if you only got one day a week to that's go, right yeah know? which most of our listeners i would think exactly. probably have if that's the case you know if your so, wife lets you go on saturday yep. you gotta go that's whether right. it's east or east, actually south, you know there's there's so many women fishing now the husband may be letting the wife go hey i'm know? good with that too yes, i wish sir. mine would like it that much for <laughs> sure Folks, this week's What'd You Learn is brought to us by Bucks Island. They have new pontoon boats, bass boats, bow riders, and aluminum boats for sale. They provide boat service on all kinds of boats, even if they weren't purchased from Bucks. Visit them at 4500 Highway 77 in Southside, Alabama, or give them a call at 256-442-2588. And also brought to you by Daycool Heating and Air. As the saying goes, if you don't like the weather in South Alabama, wait 10 minutes because it's going to change. But one of the things that is very predictable is the pricing at Daycool Heating and Air. They offer flat rate pricing and they don't charge for after hours calls. Let's face it, your HVAC always seems to act up whenever you need it the most. Don't get stuck between a rock and a hot place. Daycool offers flat $45 service calls, $59 tune-ups, and they offer free estimates on equipment replacement. The pros at Daycool have been servicing Mobile and Baldwin counties for over a decade. Contact them at 251-633-5121 or check them out online at www.daycoolair.com or on the Daycool Heating and Air mobile app. They are license number AL07028. All right, folks, Captain Bobby, I really enjoyed you being my co-host this week. I'm sure, sure. always my pleasure. And I, and I, and you know, I, I sit here with, with, in my, with the place where I sit, when I come do this with you, I look at your clock all the time. It's just hard <laughs> to believe how quick the time goes by. I, know, I don't even look at it yeah, anymore. I you know can't. it's unbelievable. <laughs> well, man, well, we enjoyed it. Uh, as always love picking your brain. Uh, Captain Patrick's a wealth of knowledge as well. He's got it. Uh, I love how analytical he is. Oh, you know, he is. When we good. talk about that all the time, too, he really, really picks it apart. He's good at that, man. Yeah, for sure. Always good to hear from you. A wealth of knowledge as well. I'm sure your um, your bookings are heating up well. If folks want to get up with Captain Bobby Abrascato and go fishing, flounder fishing. You go flounder fishing? Uh, go flounder fishing. You probably you won't do a lot now? of flounder catching. <laughs> you probably won't do a lot of flounder catching, but I can take you flounder fishing. That's right. Yeah. Well, no, man, if folks want to get up with you and book a trip, what's the best way to get in the, contact The easiest with way is my website, which is a team fishing, uh, all one word, a team fishing. Uh, and then there's a, um, contact us tab on there. It has our phone number and our, or a form you can fill out and sit, shoot it to us as easy. So that gets you to the boss lady. It gets us to the, gets gets you through you to the, the boss lady. That's exactly gets you through that. the gateway. She'll take care of you. She's gotten really good at it after almost 40 years of doing That's it. Right. So she's gotten good at it. She usually, if it, if it comes to more, more than one question, she prefers it to me. That's you know right. what That's I'm saying? If it's a, if it's a, if it's, I want to go on May 27th, she can take care of it, you know, yeah. but when it starts getting in tides and when's the best time, right. blah, blah, blah. Right. Let's go, talk Let Captain me get Bobby. the captain call you. That's back. right. That's right. I can relate to that relationship that's right. very well where yeah. I come from. So, all right, folks, that's going to wrap it up this week. You guys, please subscribe, rate and review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like us to email you the podcast each week, just text the word fishing to 314-665-1767. Again, just text the word fishing to 314 665 one seven six seven subscribe to our email list and we'll send you the new show each week we'll see y'all next week you guys keep whacking them
This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report was brought to you by Hilton's Offshore Charts, bringing you the highest quality online satellite fishing chart since 2004. Your source for sea temps, altimetry, currents, and watercolor at hiltonsoffshore.com. And also brought to you by Killer Dock. Killer Dock uses marine grade aluminum to make fabulous fish cleaning tables and stunning canopies that will keep us out of the sun. Killer Dock combines durability, function, and design to uniquely upgrade your entire dock experience. Visit killerdock.com to see more. And also brought to you by Fish Bites. Check out the full line of scented saltwater and freshwater baits as well as tackle at fishbites.com. And also brought to you by the Floribama Fishing Rodeo, the annual fishing tournament held at Floribama Old River Grill. The Fishing Rodeo focuses on bringing families together for a fun weekend of fishing on the Gulf Coast. This event is June 11th and 12th, 2021. This week's Saltwater Fishing Report is brought to you by Angelo DiPaola, the coastal connection with EXP Realty, your boating and beach property specialist. Check me out on Facebook at Angelo DiPaola Realtor, the coastal connection, or call me direct at 850-287-3440. Also brought to you by Coastal Conservation Association of Alabama. Check them out at ccaalabama.org. And also brought to you by Foster Contracting, Fortified Roofing Pros. Enjoy less stress knowing you have reduced your risk for damage with Foster Contracting. Check them out at fortifiedroofingpros.com or call them at 251-447-2978. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report was brought to you by me, Joe Baya, and National Land Realty. If I can help you in any way with the purchase or sale of land in Alabama or Florida, whether it's timberland, farmland, recreational land like hunting land, or even agricultural land or ranch land like horse farm, drop me a message at jbaya at nationalland.com. That's J-B-A-Y-A at nationalland.com.